Thanks for joining us. Mickey Finns, Marlboro PD Electric, Carolina Bank, Pepsi, uh, Florence are our sponsors. We certainly couldn't do this without them. Some of you wish we wouldn't do this uh, without them. But anyway, you've got them in the background here on the on the screen. Uh, I'm a mere I'm a mere vessel of or trying to be a vessel of somewhat of a, uh, a knowledgeable and informed opinion on matters relating to whatever it is we choose to talk about. Last week, we actually did one on on the NIL and college athletics and where it's headed or not headed. Um, this week, we're, we're going to pump the brakes on culture and society in general. We're going to be specific to politics. There's a there's a great debate in America today. There's always a great debate, and things are always different. It's kind of interesting that we, at this moment in time, believe we're the only people that have ever lived in a unique political climate or a, a you know an unpredictable political uh, arena. No, I mean that's that's not uncommon at all. Um, I do believe that it's more intense. I mean, I, I do believe that there is a and the word I've used and I've tried to explain this to a lot of others who we have these conversations casually and non casually. There's a defiance that I think is rewarded in the body politic today. There's a defiant public. There's always been suspicion. You, you kind of got a sliding scale of human emotion and, you know, I'm, I'm conforming and I'm completely defiant. And, and between there, there's a lot of, um, I, I don't multitude of ways you can feel about whatever it is we're, we're trying to better understand. And I think the defiant, the defiance of the American public have led to a certain defiance of its elected officials. It happens to be uh, the grand old party uh, and Donald Trump as somewhat of the symbol of this, uh, what I call a generational realignment may not be. We'll find out. Um, can the generational realignment persist or sustain after, you know, Cheeto Jesus comes and goes? I don't know. I don't have any idea. Um, I'm an unapologetic America firster. And, and I think I've got the bumper sticker down pad. It's um, I want policy. And I want a party to represent the American worker, the American family, and the American way of life. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things. And I'm not king nor dictator, but, but in essence, that's what, that's what I want this movement to accomplish if indeed uh, it is successful. But let, let's talk about a single issue. And, and you know, the, uh, the, the, this moment in time and what has happened in Washington, uh, for the first time in American history, there was a motion to vacate a speaker that carried the day. Kevin McCarthy was speaker of the house. He didn't die. He didn't get in trouble. Well, I guess he got in trouble with his caucus and some Democrats, but in essence, uh, Matt Gates made a motion to vacate and it was voted up. I mean, the yeas had it. And out of that came, uh, several Republicans. I think it's eight or nine Republicans joined uh, the Democrats. Anyway, Kevin McCarthy is not Speaker of the House. Now, there are counter narratives here. W one of the narratives of the, uh, the, 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 the representatives of the Uter Party and those who believe that Washington is fine and you got, you got to, you know, got to kind of control these rebellious and rambunctious um, misfits and outcasts. And if not, they'll, you know, they'll destroy this more perfect union. That politics is a pragmatic process and it requires serious thought and deliberation. And these guys are just doing crazy things, outlandish things, and and we've only got one serious party in America, and that's the Democrats, because they adhere to the structure, they adhere to the traditions, they adhere um, to the history, uh, uh, the the historical way of which we conduct ourselves, um, and that's why we don't replace speakers, just because you know Republicans and Democrats get pissed off and collaborate, and you know political gamesmanship is a big part of of this. That's one theory that you've got one adult party. That's kind of 35,000 feet. And, you know, whether you like them or not, Democrats are able to govern. And then you've got this other theory that, you know, um, the Republican establishment has made these promises when in all seriousness, they've been kind of a part of the uniparty fraud. I mean, they, they're not representative of who um, sends them to Washington every year to do a job um, that, that's, that's kind of the counter narrative that there's a big debate in America today about whether or not there's a price to be paid for doing something as outlandish as replacing a speaker, uh, because he didn't, uh, you know, make good on some of the promises that, that he, uh, made to his caucus. Uh, who knows? I mean, who knows what the right side of that coin is? Will history say one of these days 
that Republicans paid a significant price and wandered around lost in the wilderness for a generation because they couldn't govern. They were irresponsible. They were driven by emotion and fear and this defiance that was irrational and made no sense. Or will history say that was the day they took the Band-Aid off? That was the day that they genuinely held the establishment responsible. They did something nobody ever thought they would do. Now, I want to back up a half step, and I want to argue, um, if you'll allow, that Kevin McCarthy's speakership was always at risk. It was never of the norm. McCarthy made about 20 deals with 16 holdouts. As part of that deal was a single member being allowed to make a motion to vacate. Uh, He made all of these, I don't know, um, unprecedented promises to varying and different members of his caucus. And that's complicated. I mean, that, that's, you know, how do you make 20 deals with 16 people and make good on all those deals? And at some point in time, members of his caucus felt he was dishonest. Now, I'm not saying that's a reason to make a motion to vacate. I'm not a, saying that's a reason to do something unprecedented. But it seems to me that there are some politicians more in tune, more aware of where the electorate, where their electorate. I'm not talking about the Democrats. I don't know that I can comment accurately. Uh, you know, I can opine, but it would be from a, a less informed basis than I think I can about the uh, the the Republican Party. So, so McCarthy makes 20 deals with 16 members. Part of that was some pretty some pretty large promises, and you know, you got. I mean, I went through the list. You got, you know. And, and I'm not in the caucus meeting, so who knows exactly what conversations were had. But we're led to believe, and, I, and I'm speculating, some of this was no money for Ukraine. Well, let me back up. I'm not speculating. I know that. I mean, a lot of this was no money for Ukraine. Some of it was um, cut the budgets for DOJ. Remember, some of, the, um, some of the Republican voters believe that the DOJ has been weaponized, and they want to see, you know, the representatives with an R beside their name do something about it. Border security. And the funding of a kind of an increased presence at the border. Got to do something about this craziness on the southern border. And let's take Ukraine funding as an example. I'm led to believe that the speaker addressed his caucus and said there will not be Ukraine funding as part of the um, the CR. And, you know, we're talking about budgeting and we hadn't budgeted in 20 years. We're doing a CR and an omnibus and we just throw everything in a big pot. That's because the the members of Congress don't want to deal with entitlement reform because they like being Santa Claus. They like telling people, yeah, this is good and it's good and we got no money to do this and that and the other. And yeah, we can spend money in Ukraine and I mean, we secure the border. We can walk with you gum at the same time. We can, you know, we can do all these things. Well, I mean, you can't and you're not. You're failing miserably at the job of governing the country's affairs in an effective and efficient um, fashion. But but I'm speculating that some of this was. Um, and some disagreements about border security, some disagreements about DOJ funding, but I'm not speculating that some of this was around or surrounding Ukraine and um, and whether or not we continue. I'll use um, the anti-interventionist line. You ready? Um, unlimited money for endless wars. It's not whether you support funding, you know, some uh, some allowance of Ukraine to defend themselves against the um, the Russians. But rather, and I think Rand Paul's probably done a good job of explaining that, or not explaining, articulating that point of view better than anybody. Are we really going to continue to send unlimited amounts of money uh, to support endless wars? And the public has said no, and some Republican office holders were, were going that. So, so I think McCarthy meets with his caucus, and he says, okay, I'm on board. Uh, the continuing resolution will have no money for Ukraine. He goes to McConnell, because remember, it's not law until what? And it passes both bodies of, of Congress, and then the president signs it into order. So he goes to the, to the Senate, and he says, look, my guys are not going to support Ukrainian funding. McConnell says, well, I mean, uh, we, we got to have. Biden says, we got to have. Schumer says, we got to have. I mean, we can't leave the Ukrainians hanging. I mean, forget the southern border. Forget the, the, the massive invasion of illegal immigrants to our country. We can't drop the ball on Ukraine. It's a big deal to Schumer. It's a big deal to the, to the president. It's a big deal to McConnell. It's a big deal to the military-industrial complex. That's the big-ass deal, the military-industrial complex and their presence and prominence in, in our nation's capital. So I think McCarthy got twisted, a little bit like a wind chime. He knew what he had told his caucus, but he knew 
what lie ahead. And and this is where I believe McConnell's leadership has diminished a bit. Well, it should. He stared in space for two days uh, without knowing exactly where he was and then said, I'm fine. I mean, forget the last, forget what you saw the last five minutes. I'm fine. I mean, yeah, I'm in my 80s, but I'm, I'm okay. Um, absurd. I mean, the, the, but that's a podcast for, for another day. So, so McConnell gets himself at a quandary. He's promised the House that there will be no money. He's probably promised the Republicans in the House that there'll be no money for Ukraine. He, he prances over to the Senate and, you know, no, that we're not signing that. I mean, we're not going along with that. Now, eventually they did because McConnell has lost a good bit of influence. So, I mean, the, the public are saying to the, Ameri- to, to the, to the body politic, that, that we're more questionable now than we've ever been about this Ukraine funding. I mean, I've looked at a good bit of polling, and there was a day the majority of Americans supported, you know, trying to stop Putin from being the expansionist he is. Well, well now the narrative's changed to unlimited money for endless wars, no accountability, let's trust, trust Zelensky. I mean, he'll do what he says he's going to do. You know, um, Ukraine's a fledgling democracy. My ass. I mean, <laughs> Ukraine's as close a democracy as, you know, maybe not Russia and China, but that they're not some shining city on a hill, as uh, as Reagan said. So, so that's where I think McCarthy made his not his fatal mistake because I think the fatal mistake went all the way back to him agreeing to twenty concessions with sixteen lawmakers that made it highly unlikely he was going to be a successful successful speaker. So you've got these counter narratives, and and you know um, everybody in the media, academia, and 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 the influencing. A uh, part of this, everybody's on board with the Republicans blew it. I mean, they, they, they made a mockery of government. They're, they're unhinged. They're childish. Um, they don't accept the responsibilities bestowed upon them. And, and I believe in normal times that may carry the day. I, I really and truly believe historically that, that when you do something, in other words, when eight Republicans join all the Democrats and you oust a Republican speaker, the Seinfeld watcher says, well, that's dumb. I mean, why would you do that? And, and if government were a well-oiled machine, and if we weren't spending a trillion dollars a year we don't have, if we weren't allowing an invasion of our southern border, if we weren't allowing the DOJ to be weaponized against one side, this double-tiered um, system of, of justice, I think that you'd probably be right. But, but that's where I disagree with this, this perspective that the, the experts have, and beware of the expertocracy, the, the experts are convincing themselves. Maybe they're doing this for self-therapy, but they're convincing themselves that the Republicans made a grave mistake. I mean, if you work with the RNC, if you consult or lobby on behalf of any you know government agency, you got to say that. I mean, you're part of the uniparty. You owe what you have to the uniparty. You can't be an outlier. I mean, you put too much at risk. You know, I like my livelihood. I like my job. I like the prosperity bestowed upon me by being a member of, you know, the credentialed class, the uniparty, the deep state, whatever you want to put there. But I'm not sure I buy into that. I think this time is different. Now, I'm not saying I trust Matt Gates. I think Matt Gates is a grandstander. I think he's an attention seeker. Uh, you know, does he have a sincere bone in his body? He's probably like the rest of us, a mixed bag. But, but I, I just believe that every time Gates has a chance to have the bright light shining on him and the attention drawn and made about him, he will do it. So it's not, it's not Gates and his courage that I'm paying attention to, but rather for the first time in my lifetime, the threat was carried through that, that we were, and I'm talking about America firsters and, and conservative Republicans, we have been told forever that once we're in charge, we're going to do these fundamental changes to our government. We're going to budget. We're going to live within our means. We're going to secure the border. And I I accept it takes both bodies and a a president. I understand that. But but the only leverage the Republicans have today is the government shutdown. And we had a congressman come on our radio show and said something very interesting. Kind of wish I'd said it. He said, you know, the government shut the country down for a year and a half. How dare it believe it can't be shut down for a month or two months or three months? And I, and I believe this. I believe if the government were running on all eight cylinders, if the government were serving its people in, in relative fashion, if for you know, the, the, the $6.2 trillion we spend annually, we felt we were getting our bang for buck. 
I, I think the, the Democrats, excuse me, the Republicans lose this. I mean, I really and truly believe it would have been a grave era. I just sense that the American people asked for chaos and they're not opposed to it. I mean, why do you vote for Donald Trump? You, you vote for Trump as somewhat of a protest. I mean, it, it's a middle finger to the man. It's a, it's a Molotov cocktail. It's, um, you know, voting all the bums out. There's nothing about Trump ideologically that is going to transform Washington. But what he has done is empower people to do things unprecedented. Now, now he's dealt with his own issues, and he's being dealt with differently than any, any other political figure I've ever seen um, deal with. But the, the point I want to get across today, because we've got fresh on our minds something that has never happened in American politics, and that is a speaker being removed while his party obviously is in the majority. I mean, you don't get a speaker from the minority party, you get a speaker from the majority party. And, I mean, it's a bit hypocritical to me. I read some reports from, once again, some of the establishment figures that this was a grave error. And, and the biggest travesty in all of this is the you allowed, you know, eight Republicans, nine Republicans allowed the Democrats to choose its speaker or not. Well, I mean, the same Republicans were going to depend on Democrats to advance funding for Ukraine when the Republicans knew their base said no more money for Ukraine. I mean, they were going to figure out a way in the next month or two to offer up some proposal that advances funding um, to Ukraine. So there's hypocrisy in that. But, but in the macro, this moment represents a, a pulling of the Band-Aid, a, a ripping of the Band-Aid, a, an absolute example of now we're really going to hold you accountable. We've threatened. We've, we've, we've kind of walked to the edge of the plank. We, we've, we've walked to the edge of the abyss, but we've never done anything as radical as what we did um, a couple of days ago, removing Speaker McCarthy. And to the America Firster, I offer a word of wisdom. You asked for this. You wanted to be a part of a political revolution. Be careful. I mean, there, there's not a book at Barnes & Noble to say, hey, revolutions go like this. And I'm not talking about muskets and bayonets and, and grenades and bombs. And I'm not talking about I'm talking about a, a politically activist revolution. We're in the throes of that. We may be in the early stages, mid stages, don't know how big a part Trump is today. A lot. How, part, how, how, how long will the revolution last once Cheeto Jesus is gone and rides off in the sunset? Don't know. Don't have any idea. I, I love to read these opinions. Well, I know exactly what next year holds, the year after the year. Well, I don't. I mean, I'm man enough to say that I'm somewhat knowledgeable, somewhat understanding, uh, instinctively understanding of politics. I have no clue what it looks like, what the revolution looks like after after Donald Trump. But but I do believe that the ripping of the Band-Aid off, and I'm not saying good policy, bad policy. McCarthy was a good speaker, bad speaker. I think he was always a speaker at risk because he was forced to make 20 deals with 16 members who were never sure he was the right guy um, for that job. And, and you start promising a lot of different people a lot of different things because you were forced to. Those are the promises you made, and you've obligated yourself to, once again, these unprecedented um, arrangements to become, to become speaker. But, but, but in essence, my, my argument is I believe there are more Americans – supportive of chaos and controversy in American politics than there's ever been in my lifetime. I don't know what it was like when Jefferson was president. I don't have any idea. Andrew Jackson was a wildcat, um, a different kind of dude, so to speak. I have no idea how much political consternation there was, you know, during Lincoln's time at the Civil War. But obviously that's one of the greatest episodes of, you know, disagreement in, in American history. I have no idea um, CNN didn't report, Fox News didn't report then, talk radio didn't exist, uh, the internet was obviously not in play. But, but as I peruse for opinion, and I mean, obviously there are establishment Republicans that say grave error, biggest mistake ever, we'll never dig out of this hole. But those are the same guys that said Trump can't win and the Republicans must behave and be pragmatic and, and you know, participate in aspirational government. I just believe there's an element and I've asked this question, um, I think we know that the majority of Republican voters identifies America Firster to different degrees. And, and what does America First mean? What are we building the house? What does the house look like? I don't know. I mean, I've got the foundation poured. I've got some subfloor, but I don't know what it looks like. I mean, I think we're in the process of building something that we'll understand. And we're trying to make investments in 
uh, something that, once again, advantages the American worker, the American family, the American way of life. And, and, and a weaponized DOJ does not do that. Uh, a lax border security or lax border um, enforcement does not do that. Um, and a speaker that makes promises to 16 different people probably doesn't, doesn't do that. So we're ripping the Band-Aid off. And I think the great misestimation that the smart people are making is how willing the American people are to endure what it takes to get to what they perceive to be a better place. Now, is it a better place? Don't know. Hadn't been there. I don't know what it looks like. You know, what, 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 what is the room? What is the decor? What, what, I don't know. Don't have any idea. And, and I love these people that are so sure of themselves. Republicans are making a grave mistake. I mean, these guys have basically conned the Republican voters for 20, 25, 30 years. We shall see. You know, there's kind of an old story, uh, a proverb. I'll get this wrong and I'll screw it up. But I'll close with this. Um, I don't even want to try because I can't remember it. And I'll goof it up so bad. We'll do that on another. I'll actually get it in front of me on the computer and we'll read it verbatim. But it's kind of it. We shall see. It's kind of the, the point I'm trying to make. We shall see what lies ahead. Did the Republicans make a big mistake? I don't think they did. But I'm not sure. Will the Uniparty prevail at the end of the day? No. I mean, where do we go from here? I don't know. But, but I can assure you with this, uh, as I'm sitting behind this, this microphone with scribbling notes, we ain't going back where we were. I mean, the establishment uniparty days are limited, but they're not going to go down with a fight. And they're going to play the game in traditional fashion, the only way they know how to play the game. I just don't believe voters in America today find that very relatable.